Hello, everyone. I'm Ben Johnson, and this is the Perpetual Chess Podcast. On Perpetual Chess, I have weekly conversations with the chess world's best players, promoters, and educators about their lives, careers, current projects, and best practices. Perpetual Chess is brought to you through the generosity of its Patreon and PayPal supporters. For more information, go to perpetualchesspod.com. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Perpetual Chess. We have another great guest this week. He is one of my favorite Twitter follow, follows, a comment that I don't make lightly. Uh, he is a strong chess player rated about 2,250 fide, although uh, our guest does not play as actively these days, as, and we will discuss why in due time. But he was a strong junior player in Scotland. These days, he works full-time in the oil and gas industry. He's also a photographer. But most of all, he, as far as I'm concerned, he is a chess writer and and blogger um, and this gentleman just does amazing work in the chess world translating work from uh, Russian and sharing it on his blog and just an, an, an incredible wealth of information and chess history and I am so glad to have him on the show Douglas Griffin thank you for joining us thanks Ben it's a great pleasure to be here uh, I've been following your uh, podcast for a good year now and uh, listened to a lot of uh, excellent interviews and uh, does uh, it feels, uh, it feels strange sitting on the other side of the microphone from you here. Yeah, you a few <laughs> guests have said that. I know that feeling too because when I had James Altucher, who I who I listen to on, uh, I listen to his podcast sometime. So oh, yeah. Strange feeling hearing someone that you're used to, used to just listening to respond to your comments all of a sudden. Yeah, I'm expecting someone else to answer your questions. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> But uh, but I'm very glad I'm very glad that you're able to do this because uh, I mean as I said you just as someone who's I'm more of a um, casual observer of of chess history and Soviet chess history but you I mean you've just you've you've shared so much information and dig up so much incredible research and do so much translating so um, we'll I mean I I want to discuss all of that in detail but but why don't we begin at the beginning for you I mean how did you discover chess um and take it from there yeah um i'm not actually sure what age i was when i when i learned but i was maybe around about um eight or nine years old i think it was a guy at school that taught me how to play um and i liked it straight away um i mean i was born in in 67 i'm 52 and so i guess that would have been the mid 70s or thereabouts when i learned to play um and one of the first things i remember is there was a series on television um on the BBC, and it was called The Master Game. Uh, and that started around about the same time. And I remember, I think it was 77, and they had Karpov on it. And he won the, it was a knockout event. And the format was that players would play each other. I think the time control was slightly shorter than, than classical chess, but it wasn't rapid. It was still a proper proper game. And then afterwards, the players would record their comments and they would be play, they would play them back as the game was in, in progress. Um, and that was really the first exposure I had to um, to, to what real chess uh, could be about. And uh, as I say, Karpov won the tournament. He he, he beat Tony Miles in the final, I remember. And uh, that was a real eye-opener. And he sort of became an idol for me, I guess, right away. Um, he was world champion, of course. And then the next year, the first event I actually remember following as it happened, that would have been the world championship um, in Baguio against Korchnoi. I remember being on holiday uh, with my parents and um, seeing it in a newspaper. It was the score of the, the, the games. And once a week, there was television programmes on BBC again. It was the same team that did the Master Game, the same format. They had reports on, on Baguio. So I just followed the games. And then after that, I remember subscribing to a magazine. I think maybe my mother or father bought me a subscription. And that was incredible because suddenly you had, you had the score of, of all the games notes to the games and it just opened up a whole new world and of course I still hadn't played a, a tournament game by this point and didn't really know such things existed in, in Scotland um, and then in the spring of 79 my father said to me are you serious about this and I said well yeah and he decided to start taking me to the tournaments and I, you know, my father's no longer with us he passed away just over 20 years ago but every time I sit down at a board I'm kind of um, I remember the favour he did me by, by giving me the chance to get involved at a high level because he, he spent a lot of time. And I'm sure you know, there are listeners out there who maybe have kids to do the same for theirs or, or their parents did the same for them. Um, they just do the sacrifice in, in time and effort and money. 
um, and taking your youngsters to, to tournaments. So that's really what I did from the age of 12. I, uh, I began to play in junior events in Scotland and then within about six months I was, I was winning a lot of those and then I moved up to the, the lower adult tournaments and progressed through the different levels there and then by the time I was about 14 I was playing in, um, in the, what we have the Opens in Scotland I'm not sure it's the same elsewhere in the world but the weekend tournaments they would typically have uh, the junior events then they would have minor, major and Open and the Open was just for, for everyone including obviously the strongest players and by that time I was playing in the Opens and uh, then really I came to the attention of um, the there was a, a guy who was from New York. Uh, I think originally he was from Israel, but uh, lived in New York. Danny Kopek, I don't know if you know the oh, name. Oh, yeah, now. of course. Yeah, well, Danny was based in, in Edinburgh, at the University in Edinburgh, and he put together, uh, I mean, he was Scottish champion, I think, in the, in the late 70s and uh, early 80s, more than once. And he lived in Scotland for maybe 10 years, I think. And uh, he put together something where they got the best uh, juniors in the country and put us on a on a training program where we would meet Danny once a month um, all together and we would uh, we would look at games, we would look at magazines and actually that was one of the places where my interest in Russian press was first um, that first started because Danny could speak some Russian as well and he would look at the, the latest games from 64 and uh, chess bulletin, shakmatin bulletin and um, yeah that was, that was just great again it was just getting exposed to the to, 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 to the guys with that kind of skill and ability and passion because he's an incredibly passionate uh, character, Danny. So, yeah, I owe Danny a lot as well. Um, and it's funny, actually, I remember <clears throat> when I got picked for the uh, picked for the, the, the programme, the, it was at a different jun- junior tournament. They gave us a questionnaire with maybe uh, 30 positions and you had to write down what, what you would play in each of them. And I managed to recognise about four or five of the games from, from the book I had on Fisher's games because mm. I, I read it cover to cover. So I've always had a, I, I say I've always had a good memory. I, I had a, almost a photographic memory when I was younger, but it's gone now because I can still remember that game, the one in particular, and it was something that I'd learned when I was 10 years old, 11 years old, whereas games I saw maybe a month ago <laughs> for the first time, I've almost forgotten them already. So again, it may be familiar to, to some of your listeners. Um, but the memory when you're young is uh, is obviously um, much better than it is when you get older. And so I think uh, it's a big advantage to, to have learned at an earlier age. But, yeah. but yeah, thanks, thanks to being able to spot those games, I got a place on the Danny, on Danny's um, programme and uh, that helped me develop a bit more. And then um, by the time I was 16, um, I was selected to play in some junior international tournaments. Um, and that was in places like, uh, like Germany, Denmark uh, and Sweden. And um, I played in the World Junior uh, Championship in 1985. Um, that was in the United Arab Emirates. And uh, that was an interesting one. Not everyone w- was there who could have been there because um, I think because the political situation, I think uh, Israeli players couldn't get a visa. And therefore, I think some countries uh, didn't send anyone. But nevertheless, it was very strong. Uh, Ivanchuk was there, uh, as was Anand. Wow. Uh, and yeah, and I, it was quite a formative experience because just seeing these guys sitting at the board and analysing, you just realise they're on a totally different level. Yeah. <laughs> As if I didn't know that already, you know. But it really brought it home just how it's almost like a different game. So, uh, what do you think you were rated at at that time? <laughs> uh, around about probably twenty to fifty, I think. I mean, that the, uh, my highest rating was just five points short of twenty three hundred. But I think in today's money, it's probably worth a little bit more so um, I would say maybe yeah 2250 2300 okay. also slightly higher maybe but obviously Ivanchuk and Anand were already uh, already pretty strong I mean I'd seen Anand before um, I played in the, the, the tournament in London in uh, the Lloyds Bank tournament in 1984 uh, and Anand was there and uh, that was one of the first times I think he'd, certainly the first time he'd been in Britain um, and it was obvious immediately that it was what an incredible talent he was um, just the, the speed at which he played was incredible unbelievable I and mean, he would play the whole game in 15-20 minutes on his clock and uh, yeah it was obviously straight away he was something pretty special um, Spassky won the tournament that, that time as well so again just being in the same room as, as people like that it was, was really something yeah, and I, I want to hear more about that and, of course, about your time like working the demo board at a, oh, at yeah. a couple. 
Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, why don't you go ahead and, and talk about it now? <laughs> yeah, so. well, 1984, I mean, it's today um, Scotland's at the centre of attention again because we've got the tournament down the road at, at Lindoris. Um, I think the last time we had um, players of that calibre was in 1988. We had, uh, we had Tal and Spassky here, but before that, in 84, Scotland was the... It, it celebrated the centenary for the National Association, so they had a number of events uh, that summer. Uh, one of them was a tournament in Troon, which is a small town in uh, Ayrshire in the southwest uh, of Scotland, and uh, they'd had Scottish Championships in the same venue before. And that year they organised a small international tournament. It was a, a, ten, a nine round event, 10 player, um, and it was won by Sakis. And um, again, it was incredible just to, to have a guy like that, Sakis, Lev Sakis. Yeah, I had his, I had his Benoni book as a kid, but I know he wrote a lot of books, so. Yeah, and, and, and he was, uh, he won the Soviet Championship twice when he was not even, I mean, I played an interzonal and I think he was still an international master. He hadn't even got the GM title, but again, that's a reflection of just how difficult it was for them to travel. Um, but he was a really interesting character and uh, really irrepressible on the board and off it. And uh, yeah, I was, as I've mentioned, I wrote a blog post about, about that event and uh, the final round game against Pritchett um he wrote annotations to that in '64, and he wrote a short um, report on the tournament, which I which I translated and put on the blog. But yeah, I was on the demo board. Um, again, some some of the younger listeners might not know what that is. Yeah. <laughs> it's it all done electronically, but the, yeah, the big board on the on the wall with magnetic pieces that you uh, that you move around. Um, so I had a bird's eye view of that game. Um, but yeah, unforgettable. And yeah. Uh, earlier that year, they had the visit of Karpov and a played against Karpov in a simultaneous display. Um, and again, seven or eight years earlier, I'd seen him on the television for the first time, uh, and he became an idol, and then to be sitting across the board from him uh, when I was 17, was just, uh, again, you yeah. pinch yourself. How'd the game go? It was a draw. Oh, uh, awesome, amazing. Yeah, wow. yeah so that was, uh, again, just uh, it was the first game to finish, actually. It was uh, didn't last that long. It was only about 25, 30 moves, Um but he had absolutely nothing in it from the opening. And it, uh, obviously, it wasn't a clock symbol. It was uh, everyone's black. So uh, I had uh, I equalised and uh, forced a repetition of moves. And he, for him to refuse it would have been um, would have made his position much worse. And he, he didn't even repeat. He just looked at me and said, draw. And next thing, shaking hands and uh, mm-hmm. pinched himself. Yeah, incredible. And you mentioned Lev Sakis, uh, in addition to being irrepressible on the board, was irrepressible off the board. Uh, could could you elaborate on that a bit? Yeah, just a, he's just a larger than life character. He was interested in uh, in so many things outside chess as well. Um, we we played simultaneous displays against um, him and the other uh, one of the other grandmasters, um, Le- Leonid Shamkovich, who by that time was living, I think, uh, in New York as well, mm-hmm. uh, but originally a Soviet player. So Shamkovich we didn't see so much of, but Sakis we spent quite a bit of time afterwards. He gave us training sessions, and just just a bubbly guy, and just uh, I know from the the, other, the people who, who drove him around and when he was in Scotland, just just what good fun he was. I think he had some quite serious health health problems a few years ago. Um, and I think, uh, you know, it looked, at one point it looked really bad, but happy to say that he uh, he seems to have recovered. And I noticed that he's back playing in the Israeli uh, team championship um, uh, just earlier this year. So that was great to see. Um, but yeah, yeah, I saw yeah. him play over the board a couple of times. He played in London in 94 uh, in the Lloyds Bank tournament. And I was at that one. And uh, that was the one that Morozevich won with, I think, nine and a half out of ten. Um, but Sakis was there as well. So... Always been a, a player I really, uh, really liked. Um, not just as I say because he was such a nice guy, but just such a such a great player. Just real plays chess the way it should be. Yeah, and yeah. and you know all of the Soviet players so well. And you mentioned that part of what sparked your interest in in uh, being able to to read Soviet periodicals and literature was your time studying under Danny Kopak. Yeah. Um, so, but how did you learn? So, how did you learn Russian? Um, yeah, well, it's a funny one. That I mean, it's just one of these things. I've always been fascinated by Russia. Um, I even found uh, a little project that I did. I'd forgotten about it, to be honest, but it was on Russia and Russian uh, when I was still at primary school. So that would be grade uh, grade five or six or seven, probably grade six or something uh, in, in American terms. 
So I would have been maybe 11, 11 years old, and I, already I was interested in it. We had to do a project on a on a foreign country, so I did mine on this, what was then the Soviet Union. And uh, I remember a television series on BBC again. It was Russian language and people. I remember watching that, but I didn't I didn't study it formally. But then I remember when I, one of the first chess tournaments I, I was at. I think I was probably about twelve. Uh, they had book stalls at the weekend tournaments, and I bought uh, an issue of uh, Chess Bulletin, Shakhmat and Bulletin. That's one of the three the three main publications. Uh, just had lots of games in it. Didn't have a lot of text and. I knew the Cyrillic alphabet and I could figure out who was playing who um, and it just, just d- developed from there. Gradually, I used to buy these magazines as they came out. Took out a subscription when I was a bit older to um, Chess in the USSR, which was one of the other ones. And over the years, I've built up a collection of, uh, almost a complete collection of Chess in the USSR post-war. Uh, I think I've got one year that I'm missing, 1950. So yeah. it seems to be quite hard to get. <laughs> but other than that, yeah, i got the complete collection. So that's how I learned. Um, just a fascination for the country. Um, so, the, so this fascination, sorry, just to cut you yeah. off, but just to get one neat detail nailed down, you, so it predated your interest in chess. The, the, I think it might have done, yeah. I'm not sure whether I got interested in chess because of Russia or the other way around. I'm not right. actually sure, but uh, yeah, obviously they're, they're, they're not quite synonymous terms, but when you think Russia, one of the things that most people think uh, is chess. And yeah. uh, it might have been that that kicked it off. And you, you mentioned the gap in the, the one year in the Chess in the USSR periodical. Uh, yeah. how, um, how did you get the rest of them? Uh, well, I was able to buy a lot of them online. Um, they, I, I'm not sure how easy it still is because I've not, I've not looked for a while, but there are a couple of websites. Um, there's a guy in Finland called Kimo Valkasami, who uh, probably because of his proximity to, to Russia, I think a lot of the stuff he gets is from St. Petersburg, and he's in Helsinki. Um, I bought quite a lot from him. Kimo's got a great website. Um, services first class. Okay, you'll have you'll have to send me the link to that, Doug, so I can put it in the the description. Yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, basically over the years, just bought a lot of stuff from from Kimo, but one or two other places as well. And uh, back in the early two thousands, bought quite a lot of books as well when they were probably easier to get uh, than they are now. Obviously, it's a finite resource. These books. Um, a lot of them were lost during the war, uh, or, or just uh, I don't know other other sorts of other ways they just disappeared from circulation. Um, but managed to get a reasonable library built up um, back in the early two thousands. I actually went back to Russia in two thousand and one, which is the first time I'd been there for. for first time I went was two thousand and eight. Didn't go back till two thousand and one, and that kind of sparked my interest in chess again because I had a bit of a bit of a period off really in the, in the, the mid to late 90s where I didn't really look at it very much and that kind of rekindled my interest about the time my family was, was being born as well, my kids so um, yeah, it was good to, um, to to be able to get these while you still could um, because now I've noticed it's, it's a little bit harder to find some. And you went to Moscow recently too, right? Yeah, I was there with my wife in uh, February Okay, we went there for a, a holiday and you know, a lot of people Look at you! Uh, you say you're going to Russia in February for a holiday, <laughs> right? That's, but I mean, Moscow is an amazing city, and it's actually quite a good time to to visit because it does look. I mean, it looks good at any time of year. It looks spectacular in in winter with all the buildings lit up. And um, if you're lucky and you get a, a nice sparkling frost and cold, cold clear weather, yeah. it's stunning. Yeah, I've uh, I was in Moscow in 1999, and I guess it would have been. Uh, yeah, around it would have been February or March, mm-hmm. um, but but yeah, I mean, one thing I wanted to touch back on was the the translating Russian, just because the reason I was in Moscow is I studied, I did a semester abroad in in Saint Petersburg, and we took a weekend trip to Moscow, so that was the extent of my time there. But <laughs> but I mean, I so having studied Russian, I have a little bit of a, I guess you could call it, um, in, I mean, inside knowledge or more like my own suffering in terms of uh, trying to translate Russian. Um, yeah. It was my major in college, and I was pretty conversant by the time I graduated, although I'm less conversant now, I'm sad to say. But I found reading it to be particularly challenging, especially compared to sort of the romance languages, uh, you know, um, Spanish and French. And I found that my my re- my ability to read Russian could not keep up with my ability to converse. So I'm especially impressed with your ability to, to translate all of these works and uh, share them with um, the English-speaking world. 
Well, uh, yeah, I would think I'm probably the other way around, Ben. I think um, I my rush my my ability to read Russian is is much better than my spoken Russian. My spoken Russian um, is okay, very basic, um, and I'm, I think um, I speak uh, French as well because my wife's French, uh, and I know how. If you, if you if you learn any other language, it's, it's usually easier to listen to something and to understand what's being said than it is to say it yourself. Uh, and I think the same goes for understanding written language. Um, if you see something that somebody else has written and you know the context, it, it's generally easier to, to translate it correctly than if you had to write the same thing yourself just starting with, from scratch. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think... Um, it's a difficult language and it's taken me a long time to get to the level that I've got at now and it just is a case of practice uh, and cross-checking. One of the things I did, I mean, because I've got no, I mean, I have studied Russian at, at night school um, when I was in my early 20s, but I've got no formal qualification in it and I wanted to make sure that my translation of, of these annotations was actually uh, correct. So what I would do is I would take the to Botnik's collection of, of best games three volumes I would take that's been translated by Ken Neat who's a very famous uh, English uh, translator of Russian literature and I would do my own translations of Botvinnik's uh, games from Russian into English and then I would cross check it with, with Ken's and once I was noticing that I wasn't making mistakes and I was getting it more or less the same might have used slightly different words but the essential meaning was, was there then I was satisfied that I was, I was doing it correctly and I wouldn't have dreamt of publishing any of these, even just on a blog, um, without being fairly certain that uh, that the translations are correct. And uh, at first it was limited just to, to the annotations to the games. Now, obviously, there's a lot of repetition in, in the vocabulary there. Um, so you learn the, 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 the word stock phrases very, very quickly. Um, but gradually I was able to translate, I had the confidence to translate the introductions to the games and also just, just articles uh, with no chess uh, content at all just obviously the subject was chess but no chess moves in them so it's just a matter of anything like anything you just you, you, you practice and you get confidence um, but I think it was also important to to actually check that it wasn't a lot of rubbish that I was writing down as well yeah uh, yeah I would that would um that would be a big hurdle for me in terms of yeah just the insecurity of you don't know if you're doing a good job or not and yeah. and you want to share it but don't want but it also makes you, I think, I remember reading one of the next books a long time ago. He said that a way to improve um, is to annotate your own games. This was back in the Soviet era when, when uh, he was giving advice on young players on how to progress. And he said to make yourself work harder on your annotations, you should publish them. Now, this was obviously pre-internet days, but the fact that I'm going to put the annotations in a public domain makes me an extra uh, careful to make sure that they're that they're correct. So, so how long does one annotation to annotate one? I mean, sorry, to translate the annotations of one game. How long would that take you? Well, again, it depends on how detailed they are. But um, I mean, for example, uh, the last one I published was the games from the Fisher versus Larson candidates match in 1971. Um, those games weren't annotated particularly in particularly detailed fashion. I, I think probably an hour for each game, maybe something like that. But if you get one that's very deeply annotated, the first the first game of the match was more deeply annotated. It could probably take twice that. Um, but yeah, it, it does depend. But then usually I've got to, I want to format the annotations. Um, and I usually, as anyone who's looked at my blog will know, um, I put them in uh, PDF format. Uh, so it's a Word document that I then export to PDF and people can download the PDF version of the, of the annotation. Um, so yeah, there's a little bit of admin time as well. But uh, some of the more detailed annotations, yeah, they can take uh, they can take a few hours to get right. I mean, that's incredible that you don't that you you put so much time into it on top of your your regular job. <laughs> we're, well, we're it's a labor of love, as they say. You know, it's no, uh, it doesn't feel like work at all. It's just a, it's a pleasure to do, and it's something that when you're basically inherently very interested in it, then it, it makes it. Uh, yeah, it's, it's no chore at all, really. I mean, yeah. some annotations are, are more interesting than others. And if I set myself a task of annotating all the games for a match, then inevitably there's going to be some of the games in it that are a little bit dull. Um, whereas if you just pick one game for a blog, then obviously you picked it because it's it's an interesting game. So it does depend to some extent on on what type of games you're, you're looking at and what the, what the goal of the, of the work is. 
Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, okay, so we've got a, and I sent you these questions in advance, so yeah. you'd have adequate time to brainstorm them, but we've got a related question from a friend and supporter of the podcast and digital chess editor for Chess Life magazine, uh, John Hartman, who, yeah. of yeah. course, is also a fan of yours. So John says, uh, what you're doing is a great service and was part of the inspiration for my occasional series of Throwback Thursday articles at uschess.org which you guys should check out if you if you are not already. And, and John says, in the future, will you be turning these translations into a book and would you consider creating a Patreon page where you distribute PGN versions of the games? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll take the second bit first. Um, the, the PGN thing is a good idea. I think obviously um, you look at some websites and they have the advantage of you being able to play through the game on online uh, on, your, on your computer, whereas... But the way I presented them, you really have to take it offline or, or at least have a chess set next to your, your computer or laptop. So, yeah, it could be much more convenient for people to, to do it if I got it organized in a PGN format. So I haven't thought about it, but having seen John's comment, it would be a kind of an obvious thing to do. Um, as for whether I would set it up with Patreon, I guess that would be, that would be an option. Um, but, yeah, that's something I'll certainly, uh, I'll certainly consider. Um, um, in terms of the other thing, would it? publish a book well um i've got a couple of publishing projects in the pipeline in terms of the stuff that i put on the blog um it really would depend on someone obviously being interested enough to to, to publish them um i've thought about publishing myself i've had some discussions online um elan ruby from uh, elk and ruby who's publishing a lot of good books at the moment he got in touch with me actually to suggest some ways in which you can do it uh, self-publishing options um so, yeah, I'm considering that. Um, but I have got a couple of projects I'm working on at the moment. One, one's finished and another one's uh, in progress. Um, once those are both out of the way, um, then I guess I might think about going down one of those roads. Um, there may be other ways to, to, to bring it to the attention of potential publishers, but I have translated um, one or two books from cover to cover. I just need someone to, to, to publish them. Um, if people would be interested. Um, I mean, for example, uh, Lily Ental's biography, it's called A Life to Chess. It's got a little bit of biographical information at the beginning, and then it's got maybe 40 or 50 of his best games, including his one against Capablanca, for example, um, that he annotated himself. It was published in the USSR in the 60s. Uh, translated that one cover to cover, but it's just waiting for someone to say, I'll publish it. So I just need, that's, that's all it would take. Um, which uh, yeah, it's not quite the same as I think what John's asking. I think maybe John's asking would I publish a book of based on what's on the blog? Um, I don't know if there'd be enough interest for it. That's to be frank. Um, obviously, there's some people are interested in it, but whether it would justify publishing a book, um, I, I find it difficult to know whether it would or, or it wouldn't. Yeah, it's it's tough to say. I mean, obviously, <laughs> I'm interested, and I hope a lot of our listeners are interested. But I know that the the economics. I mean, you have to reach an econ- you know an economy of scale where it's worthwhile for a publisher. But I do think, yeah. I do think that um, you know, Elon Rubin probably in this age of self publishing. I mean, hopefully the actual drudge work of getting it published is not so much that even if you're just selling, say, you know, I don't know, fifteen hundred, two thousand books, something like that. I would think that that you the return on investment could be sufficient but it, there's also an opportunity cost because that might not be you're not going to make a ton of money and mm-hmm. and it might be more interesting for you to actually do the work than than do exactly. the publishing that's it in a nutshell i mean i, I enjoy doing it and I'm, I'm not doing it for the money i'm doing it because i it's something i really like and it's and the, 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 i mean i've been doing this these, these annotations that are appearing on the blog and um, they've been sitting on my computer for years i mean i've this is just stuff that i'll tidy up before i publish but um, it, it, I've got a big backlog of stuff, and I've got more stuff that I could um, publish any time I want, you know. Um, but also, there's other things I haven't translated yet that I, that I like doing as well. So yeah, it, it's not, it's not, it's just something I enjoy doing, and I, and I like sharing it. And I think that a lot of the information deserves to have a wider audience, um, so, and I can keep doing that via the blog. So um, I'll probably just do that. Yeah, I mean it's incredible because I mean obviously a lot of these Soviet magazines. They people have them. They exist in the world, but but it's the sort of thing where if someone doesn't translate them at some point, there no one may see them. You know, I mean, that's it. 
in the Western world. Yeah, and it's they, they, a lot of them. They do deserve a wider audience than they've got. I mean, the, there's three magazines basically. That the, I mean, the Shaq Matney Bulletin is almost redundant now because it's just that was just lists of games. There were, and some of the earlier editions there were articles, but they might have been a bit opening theory, so it's all out of date anyway. You get some of the end games, um, but by and large, it's just a collection of uh, of games like a tournament bulletin. So that's been superseded by databases. But the other two, 64, uh, which was a weekly publication initially. I mean, it's still going, but this is, we're talking about this in the Soviet era. It was a weekly publication, uh, chess and drafts, mostly chess. Um, and then it went back to two weekly. But still, you know, you had a lot of editions of those every year. And then the other one was chess in the USSR, which is the, the monthly one. And that was probably slightly higher quality, I would say, because the annotations appeared a little bit later. They weren't they, they weren't hot off the press, if you like, and usually they were a little bit more detailed. The annotations, um, but still, the ones in sixty four are, are perfectly good, and I'm quite happy to to translate them uh, and put them on the blog. But yeah, it, it would be a shame if they never saw the light of day because uh, uh, these are top quality pieces of work by some of the biggest names in chess that I've ever been. Um, and uh, for them just to be sitting there in an archive, um, yeah, it's, it would be a shame. Yeah, I actually had pulled the quote from um, the the Botvinnik translation you did regarding Fisher Larson. Uh, yeah. I, I meant to mention this to you before we recorded, but I think one of us should read this quote. So I, I don't know if you want no, me to. No. I don't know if you want me to, or if you want to do it. No, you can read it. Okay. So, uh, yeah, this is just an example of the stuff that, that Doug is putting up on his blog for free. Uh, mm-hmm. Botvinnik quote, quote regarding uh, Bobby Fischer. Um, so he's... Yeah, this was, uh, sorry to interrupt, Ben. This was at the end of the match with Larson. Yeah, so at the end of the... the, the this is the candidate cycle, right? Yeah. So the, at the end of the candidate cycle from Larson, Botvinnik is uh, talking about when he had previously seen Fisher. So he says, uh, Fisher has aged nine years since then. True, he experienced a crisis during 1968-69 when he did not appear in competitions. What was wrong with him, Fisher has not said. In the match of the century, he made a new step forward and began to regularly defeat grandmasters. And this is not – so there's two matches of the century. Um, this is referring to the 1970 uh, USSR versus rest of the world. Yes, that's right. Okay, um, not not the Fisher Spassky match, but mm. but who did he win against most confidently in appearances against the nine grandmasters who proved to be at the head of the table in the interzonal tournament in 1970? He five times achieved success, including games against four chess players aged between 44 and 49. It's well known that at this age, one's ability at calculating variations has begun to weaken. Against the five chess players aged from 22 to 37, Fisher scored only 50 percent. In all, against the nine grandmasters, Fisher scored six and a half points, a brilliant result. It should be kept in mind that eight of the nine grandmasters had all at different times been candidates, while the ninth was Poligayevsky. Such a result happens only to outstanding masters when they are on their way to the world championship or when they have already been world champions. And here in Vancouver and Denver against chess players of such class, Fisher has achieved not a 72% result, but 100%, and not in a tournament, but in matches, which is more difficult. This had never happened before to the American, indeed, not only to him, but never before in the history of chess. For example, Emmanuel Lasker during 1907 to 1910 in matches against Marshall and twice against Janikowski achieved an overwhelming advantage, but this is, and then he lists the scores, but this is not 12 0. So what is it, the further advance of Fisher to the heights of chess art or a miracle? If the former, this is a cause for joy. Chess will be enriched. If the latter, then what will Fisher do when the miracle is over, when from a state of weightlessness he returns to reality, when he encounters tough resistance? Will the American overcome these or will he suffer a new crisis as he did two years ago? This undoubtedly would would be to the great detriment of chess. Detriment, excuse me, of chess. We will see. So yeah, kind of prophetic almost because although he didn't, uh, his problems were off the board. But yeah, he, he ran into problems, and, and yeah, we know what happened. Yeah, just incredible to have that perspective in real time, basically. <laughs> um, That's the good thing about these these publications is that you, you see things as people saw them at the time as well, without the benefit of hindsight. Um, and also something else worth mentioning that article by but I mean I only spotted that a few days ago just before I put the, the games from the Fisher Larson match on the blog uh, I went back to the original issue of 64 and just checked that everything was, was correct 
Uh, and when I was doing that, I spotted this article by Buck Minnick, and I hadn't even noticed it before. There's just so much information uh, in these magazines. They're, they're, I, mean, I think John Hartman uh, mentioned that he started uh, he used, he's doing the same thing for one of the US chess publications, looking back at uh, old editions of magazines and resurrecting the, <clears throat> the games and the annotations from them. And he used the term mining, and that's exactly what it is, because there's this incredible wealth of, of raw material there that just needs to be brought out to, to a wider audience. Yeah. Almost exhaustible amount. Yeah. So, I mean, you, you're you writing, basically, you're covering the, the 20th century, and, yeah. you know, with a particular emphasis on, on Soviet chess. Um, yeah. So... Where did you start once once you took an interest? Do you do you remember uh, a certain book that you read, or was there something that just like made you feel like your your interest was su- suddenly uh, growing exponentially, or has it been more slow and steady over the years? I think it's probably been more slow and steady. I mean, I think um, I remember uh, in 1994, um, I was still I, I'd started to slow down a bit over the board by then. I wasn't playing as much. Um, I played in the tournament in London, but then uh, that same summer I went to Hungary with the Scottish junior squad. Um, they were playing in the World Youth Championships. Um, and I'll come back to that in a moment, actually, because it was incredible to look back on. Uh, but yeah, there was a lot of Russians there, um, I don't, uh, possibly along with um, possibly some of them are trainers, I'm not sure, but they were selling books. I mean, I think times in the early 1990s were, were pretty difficult in Russia. Um, and money was maybe a little bit scarce for, for a lot of people. And it was really, it was sad to see, you know, the guys were selling everything they could, uh, including a lot of a lot of books. And there was a series of books published in the Soviet Union um, in the late 1980s, just before the fall of the, the, the Soviet Union. And they became known as the Black Series, um, just because of the colours of the books. Um, and they were all on uh, outstanding chess players, so guys... Uh, and not the most outstanding, not the world champions, but the ones just under that level. So guys like maybe Furman and Holmov and uh, Mikinas or, 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 or you know, Soviet grandmasters, and I had a collection of their games. And that was when I realised that, that there's some tremendous information here, and if my Russian was just a bit better, uh, I'd be able to get a lot more out of the books. So that was the start of it, I think. But it wasn't like a, an overnight thing, it was gradual. Um, uh, so that would have been yeah in the nine, and then to the late nineteen nineties I wasn't playing or so much chess and looking at so much chess but then it got rekindled by that visit to Russia in two thousand and one and then I got back into it and really since then it hasn't stopped I've been uh, gradually uh, working my way through all the publications all of the magazines and uh, I'm translating uh, what I can uh, and still a lot to do you know to be to be fair there's a lot of stuff I've, uh, I've not got around to yet that, that I, uh, it's on my on my list of things to do. Yeah. So, w- do you have anything that you're that's on your list of things to do that you're looking forward to more than more than others, like a particular book or magazine? Uh, yeah. I mean, I've, I've got some old. Um, I've got the Soviet Championship books from the tournament books from uh, nineteen forty nine. There, there was there was early ones even than that. I got one from nineteen. 19- 30, uh, one from 34, 35, and then 37. There were Soviet championships in these years. There was full tournament books produced. Uh, I've translated a lot of those already. Um, the same goes for the one in 19, 1940. There was a little tournament book produced. For some reason, the one in 19, the next one was 45, I think probably obviously end of the war. Um, maybe other things to be doing. Uh, but then by, by the late 40s, 49, I think was the first one. Uh, this that would be the 17th USSR Championship. They produced a tournament book for that and all of the next uh, five or six years. So, to my knowledge, none of those have been published uh, in English. So, uh, I've translated most of the games, um, the annotations from the books to most of the games, but not the accompanying text. So, again, it would be a project that would be quite, uh, if there was a market there for it, um, if any publisher wanted to do it, you know, most of the work is already done. Um, and I think that would be fascinating to to get those out there. Uh, it would be a, again, it would be a labour of love to do. Uh, I mean, another one which is a book that I've heard mentioned quite a lot on your uh, on your show by guests um, is the book on uh, Rubinstein by Razavayev and Murakhveri. Again, I've translated all the games, um, the original annotations by Razavayev, 
I haven't done the biographical stuff on, on Rubenstein. Um, again, as it happens, there are there's a couple of very good books on Rubenstein by, I think, Donaldson and Minev, um, which probably covers a lot of the biographical detail. But given just how many people refer to that book, it could be an interesting one to get out there. But in terms of ones that I... I don't think there's any books that I've got that I haven't done any work at all on. Um, so... Uh, there's nothing that I've, I, I, I've still to discover, if you like, that I, I would like to translate. I've already done a little bit of work on, on most of them, but obviously some, some of them have got a bit more work remaining uh, than others. And but, uh, yeah, sorry, man. Oh, that's okay. Uh, yeah, just uh, along that vein, you mentioned the, the missing year of the, uh, the Chess USSR yeah. periodicals. Do you have any other sort of white whales that you're chasing in terms of uh, – Russian books that you, you're trying to get your hands on that you don't have yet that you really want to see what they have to say? Not not really. I'm lucky enough to be able to say. I mean, I, I, there may be some that I don't know about, but um, I think I, I was quite lucky in that I got in there when it was still possible to get your hands on, on just about anything. And I think that the, the, the pound ruble exchange rate was probably better uh, than it is just now as well. So that you could get these for snapped up reasonably, uh, reasonably cheaply. I mean, it's quite interesting. I remember... There were two two fantastic tournament books which have already been translated into into English. Um, the, the, the second and third Moscow internationals, so they were in 1935 and 1936, and um, I've got both of the the tournament books from from those events. And I remember having to pay a little bit more because they still had the photograph in the introduction uh, of a guy called Krylenko, Nikolai Krylenko was an old Bolshevik. He was one of the, I think he was the supreme leader of the, the Red Army in 1917. And then he became state prosecutor. And he was responsible for some of the the repressions that happened in the 1930s. And uh, you know, he was responsible personally for, for quite a lot of deaths. Uh, but he was also a fanatical chess player. And he was director of the chess section um, in, the, in the USSR in the mid-1930s. So he's... he's Picture was in these books, but then he himself got um, got repressed and executed. I think it was a twenty minute trial, uh, around about 30, 1937 or thirty eight, and suddenly it became very dangerous for people um, to have a book with his picture in it. Wow. So quite a lot of the copies of these books are available, but with the picture torn out. Huh. Um, and to, to get the, the the copy with the picture still in it, you had to pay a few pounds more. Um, but it gives an insight into just how. Um, how scary things must have been um, in the USSR and that, in that time in 37, 38 uh, especially 37 I think was the, the, the worst year from, from the point of view of the, the purges Wow mm. that, that's incredible incredible perspective that's that's crazy so do you have do you, does yours have the picture in it? Uh, yeah I, I decided to fork out a little bit more and get the, get the two with the, uh, with the pictures in it that's good. Yeah, I mean, it, it seems like money well spent. I'm surprised the difference isn't greater. Although I guess yeah. it's kind of a niche thing to begin with. So it is, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Most people probably wouldn't care. I guess the <laughs> about the book. Never mind uh, whether it's got the picture. Um, okay, so we've got another question from a friend and supporter of the podcast uh, from Chris Wainscott. Um, Chris says. Doug, first of all, your blog is amazing. I wish I had been aware of it prior to now. I'm a serious fan of so Soviet era chess, so so much so that I occasionally review books for Susan Polgar's website under the name Patriarch Fan. My question for you is: Who are some of your favorite lesser known Soviet players? Thanks for your work on the blog. Yeah, it's good to hear. I'm grateful for the, for those comments. Um, yeah, I had to think about it. I think. Obviously, everyone's heard of the of, of the top players. I mean, it's difficult for me to say who are the, the lesser known ones, but um, I mean, Lily Intel is probably lesser known. I mean, I really enjoyed working on his book. Um, Boleslavsky, again, can't, I'm not sure if you can call him uh, a lesser known, but uh, a fantastic player and innovator. And a, a quite a big, I'm not sure if the point's been made, but I've, I've often thought a very big influence on Fisher. Um, I mean, we know that Fisher could read Russian uh, from a young age. I mean, for example, there's a famous book by Lipnitsky um, called Questions of Modern Chess Theory, and Fisher is known to have been uh, a big fan of that book, and it didn't appear in English until quite recently, actually. It was published in, uh, here in Scotland by in translation by Quality Chess. Um, but yeah, uh, he almost certainly was familiar with the book of Boleslavsky's games because if you look at the opening repertoire that Boleslavsky had, 
and the opening opening repertoire that uh, that Fisher had from his early days and, and throughout his career. A lot of crossover there. I mean, the King's Indian, obviously, but also some of the openings with White, um, the Bishop C4 against the um, the Sicilian. Bolislavski won a famous game. I think it was against Aronin in the late 40s that appears in his book of selected games. Um, the two nights variation against the Carroll Khan, for example. Bolislavski again. Uh, that was Fisher's choice, certainly, in, in his earlier days. So, yeah, um, a fantastic, fantastic uh, chess player and good, good annotator as well. So, whether he's lesser known, I, I don't know. Um, then there's uh, other people like um, or Furman. I mean, Semyon Furman, the trainer of, uh, of Karpov. Uh, phenomenal player and phenomenal theoretician, especially, uh, especially strong with the white pieces. I think he was sometimes called the world champion with white. Uh, he was pretty decent with the black pieces as well. Um, Holmoff, who I've mentioned already today, an incredible player. Um, and when you look at his life story, I don't know if, if you know about that, Ben, but his early days, you know, when, when you're used to reading about chess players being schooled in the in the Pioneers' palaces, uh, Holmoff, his parents worked in a labour camp near Arkhangelsk in the far north of uh, European Russia, and he lived in Arkhangelsk with his parents inside a labour camp and I think his father was arrested so he was brought up with his mother but he uh, describes himself uh, when he was young as having been, been a bit of a hooligan and hmm. got, into, got into trouble with the law he avoided uh, being drafted when the war started but he ended up on a fishing boat and I think he uh, was sick and when he refused to go back to work he, uh, he got put in a camp himself so he, he did time in a camp and then he got back to sea and he was on a, uh, uh, I think it was a cargo ship. He ended up in the United States, believe it or not. He was in Oregon and San Diego. And uh, then he, on the way back to uh, to Japan, to, to Vladivostok in the Soviet Far East, they, they hit a mine and he ended up in Japan. And uh, I think because of all these experiences that he had, he found it very difficult when he got back to chess because I think he already played chess by, before the war. When he got back to chess... They wouldn't trust him to go to the West because of his experiences during the war. But uh, so that I think that hindered his development as a, or, or at least it made him less well known in the West. Put it that way, he probably possibly didn't hinder his development. But but a very very strong player. I mean, you look at the game he won against Fisher uh, with Black in the tournament that Fisher played uh, by Telex, the Capablanca Memorial Tournament. He crushed Fisher with the black pieces, and this was in '65. So um, yeah, and he was again if you read his. Uh, I and mean, again, a book I should mention is uh, to anyone who's interested in, in Russian uh, history, Soviet uh, chess history, uh, is Russian Silhouettes by Sosonko. And, yeah. there's, uh, and there's a follow-up to it. With, um, for, for, I think it might be the Smart Trip one, which has an interview with Holmov. And Holmov talks about the night before he, he played Fisher. He was really drunk on <laughs> Rome in Cuba. So he played that game with a terrible hangover and he still, uh, he still crushed Fisher. So yeah, Holmoff, what an incredible character. Sorry, what did, Doug, what did you say the follow-up to Russian Silhouettes was? Uh, there's, there's two. There's one called The Reliable Past and another one which I think is called Smart Chip, which is, he, that was the n- nickname for a guy called Chepukaitis, who was a, a character from St. Petersburg, who was a phenomenal blitz player. Um, but I can send you the, 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 the names of, of the two follow-ups uh, okay. published by New Chess. But yeah, what, the third one has a, uh, the interview with uh, with and a portrait of Ratmir Holmov. So another another amazing player. Um, and then I guess uh, I should mention Levenfish because that's the book I've, I'm hoping to have uh, one of the books I'm, I'm hoping to have published this summer uh, is the biography of uh, a Levenfish. Probably not again not so well known uh, because uh, he didn't really play much in the West. Although uh, very strong player, he won two Soviet titles and. Uh, he drew a match with Botvinnik for the Soviet Championship. Basically, he had won the two Soviet titles in which Botvinnik hadn't played, so they felt that to decide who really was the best player in the Soviet Union, Botvinnik would have the right to, to challenge him in a match. And uh, they played, um, I think, 13 games in all, and the match was drawn. So again, just shows you what an outstanding play eleven fish was, because at that time, Botvinnik, uh, he was one of the top players in the world. He'd won... Uh, He'd won in Moscow, 35, and I think he'd, he'd uh, Nottingham, 36 as well, and I think he finished running up in Moscow in 36. So, 
11 fish to draw a match with him in 37 over that number of games and I think he beat him three or four times I think three times uh, out of the 13 games and I think Botvinnik has lost fewer than that number of games in, in all of his events I just mentioned so uh, yeah, yeah a fantastic player and a very interesting character uh, and that's really the first proper translation work I've done uh, in that it was mostly uh, Russian prose rather than just annotations to games so that was uh, that was actually a bit of a step up um, in translation work so how, long, all, how long did all, that project take you Doug the Levin fish that was yeah I never really kept track of how many hours it took but it was a fairly serious bit of work I mean um, I did get in touch the, the guys at Quality Chess I know uh, I've known John Shaw um, for a long time Um John uh, is a grandmaster, as I'm sure many of your listeners know. Um, he was a very late starter in chess. I think he, uh, he, uh, he he didn't really begin to play seriously, I think, till he was in his late teens, and yet he became a, a, a grandmaster. So, yeah, I've known John a long time, and uh, I got in touch with John maybe a couple of years ago and said, look, I've got all these games that I've got uh, just waiting to, to find a publisher. Is there any chance you might uh, be interested in publishing anything? And I sent him a list of possible um, options and one of the ones that uh, John and Jacob, who was one of your recent guests, uh, came back with was the Levenfish memoir. So, uh, a very interesting life story uh, outside of chess as well. Um, and yeah, how long did it take? I think I started working on the. I got the I got the go ahead from them, maybe about this time last year, and it was probably two or three months before I had uh, I'd finished. So okay, not uh, not too bad. The games I had already done, so it was just a case of reformatting them. But it was mostly the uh, the other uh, the, the, the the biographical information that that, that Levin Fish wrote about his life. Right. Well, well, we look forward to the to the book. Um, should, ah. should should be a lot of fun. Mm. I hope so. Yeah. So so I, we're very grateful that Quality Chess is uh, supporting your work and and look forward to seeing this. Um, this book on Levin Fish. Um, you mentioned some some challenges getting other books published, or at least you haven't found publishers. Yeah, what are what are your interactions with publishers generally like? Um, how, like how much how much effort are you putting into finding it to finding well, publishers? Uh, the only ones I contacted directly were were Quality Chess, just because I, I know John. Okay. Um, the uh, the other one, that, I mean, I'm working on a project at the moment. It's uh, for Chess Informant. And um, they got in touch with me through, I think it was through um, Twitter. It was Igor, Igor Zveglich uh, from Chess Informant. And uh, I'm going to have a column in forthcoming editions of, uh, of Chess Informant, which is going to take the, for anyone who's familiar with the, the, the tweets that I do with or photos of, of from websites that I've found, especially the Dutch archives. It's a fantastic resource. So you can, you can find a lot of photos online, isn't it? without too much trouble. So I typically post a photo with some information about the game. The Chess Informant want to publish uh, one of the games from their archives, one of their old magazines, and um, with a photograph to accompany and some notes and the background of the game maybe. So somewhere between the content of my blog and the content of the, 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 the short tweets that I, that I publish. Um, and that's going to be a regular feature, which I'm, I'm really excited about because... Um, I'm one of the chess informant generation, I guess. Yeah, um, you know, for someone who, who was learning the game in the late seventies and, and the nineteen eighties, I mean, chess informant—it's impossible to overstate just how how important that uh, publication was. I mean, this was the days before Twick. Um, twice a year, you would get this uh, this book, and not only did it have all these games that you hadn't seen before, but they were annotated by the players who played them, top players in the world, and. Uh, yeah, fantastic publication. So to be working with him is is great, and we're also working on. Uh, we mentioned earlier on the match of the century. Um, next year in March, it's going to be the March April. It's going to be the fiftieth anniversary of the the match in Belgrade, and um, Chess Informant published a book which I, I have a copy of, with uh, annotations to all of the games by the players. So it would have the annotations by the rest of the world players in English. But the annotations uh, of the Soviet players were in Russian. So the idea is we're going to produce a 50th anniversary book um, with the annotations. So you've got people like well, Fisher played Petrosian, for example. So four games there, Larson Spassky on top board. Mm. Um, and with an, it's quite interesting to see both players' context on the game. Um, so, yeah, that's going to come out um, 
in time for the 50th anniversary of that. I believe we're going to have the involvement of um, Boris Ivkov, who was one of the players in the match. He's still alive, thankfully. And then um, Alexander Matanovic, who was the, one of the founders of Chess Informant, uh, he's still with us too, and he's going to be involved in the book as well. So, um, yeah, really excited about that. But um, I'm fortunate that uh, Igor had got in touch with me and um, we've taken our collaboration from there. That's awesome. Yeah, and yeah, like you say, the informant, it was just, I mean, it was just such a <laughs> such an inter- integral part and and yeah. and stuff like that i mean it you look forward to it so much and uh yeah, yeah it was major mm-hmm. event when it got published and so many of the, the symbols we use even in, in chess annotation this was all developed by by these people and in, in, uh, back in the 60s um and yeah the world the chess publishing world would be a very different place uh without uh, without chess and form yeah it really would um so doug I, I just I don't have a ton more to ask you, but one thing I think our listeners I think we'll skip the chess improvement talk. I mean, obviously you're a strong enough player to give your own uh-huh. advice, but I don't see why anyone should listen to me on that. <laughs> 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 myself, if the, uh, if well, the yeah, it's not. I mean, I, I think you would have plenty to advise, but I mean that's not the the emphasis of your work right now. Uh, it's similar to, I mean, I, I end up talking about it some, but but I'm not working hard on my chess right now either. I mean, I'm more interested in other aspects of chess as well. Um, but you could definitely give advice about um, uh, your favorite books that have been published in the English language, especially those with a historical perspective. I, I know, as we talked about, I noticed that Russian Silhouettes is one that you end up quoting a lot on your blog by uh, Grandmaster Jenna Sosanko. Yeah. Uh, do you have Do you have any other favorites? Um, I mean, I, I would have to say um, most of my favorite books are actually. They're actually in the Russian language, um, and uh, they've not all been they've not all been translated. But some that have, uh, I mean, I think the three volume uh, work of Botvinnik's Games um, that was published in the Czech Republic, I think, uh, about maybe fifteen years ago. I'm not sure how easy it is to to get your hands on now, but um, I think it was just called Botvinnik's Selected Games. Um, although the original Russian translation was something. A, a bit more unusual. It was analytical and critical work. You can see why they <laughs> they changed it. Um, there's also the collection of Smyslov's games, which was produced by the same uh, publishing house. Um, that was those both of those books were translated by Ken Neat, who, who I mentioned earlier. But I think for any player, it's important to to have collections of the best games annotated by the best players themselves. I think um, that almost goes without saying. So um, obviously not all of the the best players in chess history did annotate all, all of their games or even many of their games. But, you know, you take Alekin, for example, you have to have his games in your collection. Um, he published uh, two, I think, 1908 to 23 and 1924 to 37, I think. Um, so you have to have those. Um Smyslov's best games, Tal's Life and Games, um, I think was the, the Life and Games of Mikhail Tal, I think the yeah. book's called. Yeah. Fantastic book. Um, Karpov has published some co- games collections. I mean, some are, there are two or three I'm available, I've seen, but I think the one, his early one from, uh, I think it was published in English by RHM Press, which I, I got when I was quite young. Uh, that's a, that covers his years up until about 1977. I think Edition Alms, the Swiss publishers, may have published one more recently than that that gives his games from later in his career. And of course, the, the, the Kasparov, you know, none of this is any surprise to anybody the Kasparov books that, that came out. But um, also some, possibly some lesser, lesser known ones. I mean, uh, Leonard Stein um, was a, another phenomenal chess player, um, but he didn't really annotate many of his own games. Uh, I think that there is a publication by uh, someone or other who translated a book by Gufeld and Lazarev. So that's a good one as well. But again, I've, I know it's available in English, but I've, I've got it and, and read it in, in Russian. Uh, fantastic book by a, by a, a really f- phenomenal player back in the, in the late 60s and uh, early 70s. He was probably one of the top three or four in the world. In fact, he did play in the, uh, the match of the century uh, in Belgrade um, 
on the reserve board and played in the last round against Larson. So he was recognised as being in, in the world elite. But yeah, those, those would be the ones that would, that would spring to mind, certainly. Wow, a lot of, lot of great recommendations. And and when you were a top a top young player when you were when you discovered chess and uh started to to really dive in what was your approach back then to to learning i mean were you like a book reader or someone that learned by playing no very much a book reader um i mean i, I think i've been pretty I've generally been pretty well read i think um probably uh, I think I, I could have been better if I played more, probably. But I've always been more interested in the in the game for its for, for all the chess culture that goes around it, rather than in, in proving that I can win games. To me, it's been more just about the love of the game. And uh, yeah, I mean, I think I was as I mentioned right at the start of the interview. I had read quite a lot before I even played a game in a, in a tournament. And, yeah. Uh, to me, it was always just more about the, the game, the history, the culture, the characters. Uh, that, that I've played again. There's something actually that, that and I really enjoyed your interview with Andy Soltis um, because I've read obviously a few, a few of his books on Soviet chess and uh, he spoke quite a bit about how just the, the life experiences that some of these people had had outside chess and um, yeah, just, just reading about the not just the games but the lives of these people has always been, uh, been really fascinating for me. But in terms of improvement, um, I mean, I knew... The chess informants that came out—I mean, they, they would be read cover to cover. Um, so I was always reasonably up to date with with opening theory when I was playing because of the because of chess informant. That was how you did it back in those days. Um, and so it was a matter of just playing through games of chess informant from chess informant, and also the games of, of from these books that I mentioned, uh, the game collections of of the of the very best players. And as I say, good to have the annotations by the players themselves. Um, I think that, that was key. So, yeah, I think just a lot of repetition, a lot of pattern recognition, I think, uh, in chess. I mean, I can still... Um, I've seen a couple of things uh, online. Um, I think it was one was with Magnus Carlsen and another one was with Daniel Duboff, where they, they showed them games from chess history, positions from chess history, and asked them what the game was. And I, I actually got the answers right for a lot of them, and most of them, I would say. Well, almost all of them, except for the ones that were played after about 1990, because that's when A, I was playing less, and B, I was older, so my memory uh, wasn't as good as it was. But I think it will take you quite a long way just having a good memory. Um, and I think being familiar with a lot, I and mean, obviously seeing a seeing a position doesn't make you, make you a stronger player, but it, it does allow you to recognise patterns and, uh, and, and remembering that you've seen something before and remembering what the, what the plans were and remembering the course of the game that can that can help. Although obviously you have to be able to do a lot more than that. But yeah, having being exposed to chess culture, I think, for want of a better phrase, um, is a really important thing. I think. Yeah, I mean, just today well, before we started recording, you you had tweeted something out about recognizing uh, the yeah. Car- the Carlson game that's going on. Yeah, I mean, I, again, I looked at the. the I, 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 got the uh, website on and it showed the position after about eight or nine moves and I saw the diagram and I thought that's a Petrosian game and it's a really unusual looking position as well which probably helps um, but yeah it was Simigan versus uh, Petrosian I couldn't I was fairly sure it was uh, Simigan but I wasn't certain but yeah um, recognised it straight away but if that game had been played in 1995 then I probably wouldn't have had a clue in fact it, it could be a game that had been played six weeks ago and I might have even followed online and right. already, I've forgotten it because that's just what happens to the memory as uh, as you get older. It's certainly not what it was. Yeah, and and for listeners getting discouraged, if you don't have the memory that Doug has, do remember that Evgeny Barev provided a counter <laughs> a counterweight to that. To I that heard system. that. Yeah, I was I was amazed at that actually. Yeah, he, he basically uh, and he also said Karpov didn't uh, doesn't have a very good memory, which. Uh, yeah. yeah, I mean it's it's incredible. I I think I don't know. I think these things may all be relative. I mean, yes, absolutely. Yeah, because uh, I'm sure that Karpov uh, probably has an above average memory. I would guess, but maybe compared to an elite chess player, he needs to work harder. I think that's it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but no, I think um, it's been uh, really interesting listening to to the, the little snippets like that that you get from 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 your podcast Ben it's just I'm sure on behalf of a lot of your listeners just to see uh, you know how much how much uh, enjoy these these little insights you get into to players I had no idea that Barry if uh, 
felt that way about his own memory. Um, yeah, yeah, pretty funny. Yeah, and I remember seeing him. At, uh, he played. Um, yeah, I've seen him a couple of times in, in my travels. Uh, he played at Hastings one year when I was there, and uh, again, that's something that when I look back at the the, 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 the players I've seen, um, when you're younger and you see players close up, you tend to. It doesn't. I mean, obviously Barry is still young, but thinking of some of the older players that I've seen, you just wish you'd paid more attention because a lot of them are not are not around anymore. And but when you're young and you see these guys, you just assume they're going to be around forever. Yeah, you know, Bort Snellys and Smith Loves, and and I mean, I met Bronstein one time as well. Um, and uh, when he was in Scotland, and uh, I think it was 90, 92 or ninety three. Um, and I mean, now I'd be beside myself if I knew I had the chance to meet Bronstein. Right. But, yeah. So but back then it was just oh yeah, Bronstein. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, I was a little bit excited, but nowhere near as excited as I, as I should have been. Um, so what was your interaction uh, with Bronstein? <laughs> he was playing in a, a weekend tournament. Would you believe? I mean, I'm never quite sure why, um, but it just happened to be um, in the same place that I was living at the time, uh, just outside Glasgow. He was there, and uh, I knew he was. I'd heard he was there, and I wandered down and and got the chance to to speak to him uh, after the final round of the, of the tournament, and he. Uh, just incredible that the, the, the guy was a living piece of uh, of chess history. I remember when he he took out his um, wallet and he took out his pocket chess set, and his wallet was embossed with um, Gothenburg Interzonal 1955, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and then he demonstrated a game his game against Keres from that tournament on on the pocket chess set um, to some people, myself included, who were, who were watching, and just unforgettable. Yeah. Just, Amazing. And and who's the strongest player? Maybe not necessarily at the time, but who is the player who achieved the highest rating that you've ever played, Doug? Um, probably John Spielman. Yeah. Uh, I played Bruce. him when I was uh, 17. It was, again, it was a weekend tournament uh, in England. We, myself and some other Scottish juniors, we travelled south, and I got paired against Spielman with Black in the first round. And... Um, Believe it or not, my position after about 30 moves was absolutely, completely won. <laughs> and uh, and I, the whole thing collapsed in the space of about three or four moves. I blundered and uh, I just, just went from being won to, 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 to utterly lost. But uh, yeah, that was disappointing. But again, um, when you're 17, you kind of take these things in your, in your stride. Uh, Hodgson, I played Hodgson when he was pretty strong. He was almost 2,600. That was in... 1988, and I drew that uh, 88, 88 or 89, uh, and I, I drew that game, so that was that was quite a good result. Um, but uh, yeah, not, not too many. I mean, I think other grandmasters I've played with Scott, the Scottish ones, obviously, uh, Matwani McNabb, um, Jonathan Rowson came along a little bit after after my time, so we never we never played other than a, a rapid game. I think when Jonathan was very very young, um, I think I played Kurayitsa, who's a Yugoslav grandmaster, but uh, yeah, not, he was past his best by the time the time we played. But yeah, it's just been good to see. You know, as this comes back to what I was saying earlier, I've never been under any great illusions about my own ability. It's just to just to be able to to see these people play and uh, and to be in the same tournaments as them and to to, to just to be around them. It's always been inspirational. Yeah, and- given, given, given us all, I mean, all the people. I'm sure your listeners as well. It's just chess has given us all so much. Yeah, it really has. And sp- speaking of getting to see them, did you have any thoughts of uh, making it down to, to Lindor Abbey for this world-class tournament? I, I did, actually, yeah. Um, I, mean, I noticed, I think, the tickets were selling up. There might have still been some available today, but um, I'll probably kick myself for not having gone there, but I believe it's sold out for, for tomorrow. But, okay. Uh, I did see, I mean, I've, I've, uh, not that I would have, I mean, I've been delighted to, to, to see them again, Lindoris, but... Uh, I've seen a few. I mean, I saw, I saw Carlson in um, the candidates tournament in London in 2013 when I was I was in London with work and I was able to go along uh, afterwards. That was that was a great experience. So I'm sure today would have been up there with that. But no, it just just didn't prove possible, unfortunately. Yeah, I know how it is. I live down the road. I mean, not down the road, but you know, 80 minutes from New York, and I don't yeah. I don't make it there yeah. as much as one might think. Um, yeah. Okay, so Doug, last thing, you just mentioned your work. Um, uh, could you tell us just a little bit more about what you do wh- when you're not translating chess? Yeah, well, I mean, work-wise, I work in the, in the oil and gas industry. It's on the government side, on the regulation side, and I've done that for a very long time. I mean, I used to be a, an inspector, so I used to have to go out to the, uh, 
to the platforms we have, oil and gas in the UK, and um, most of it's offshore uh, in the North Sea. So uh, I used to go out there for a few days at a time, um, probably 20 times a year. So that um, was another reason why I didn't play so much chess in the in the late 90s is that I couldn't really be sure where I was going to be um, with any certainty. So um, that, that's been on the work side. But then um, when I haven't been playing chess, I... Uh, Run about the time in the early early nineteen nineties, I began to develop an interest in um, in the, the great outdoors, hill walking, and that developed into climbing and photography. So, I spend a certain amount of my free time um, taking photographs of uh, of the mountains, and I, I guess I also developed uh, my interest in photographs of uh, of chess players that I've put on Twitter because. Uh, and it's one of the reasons why, whenever possible, I always credit the photographer. On yeah. My as, uh, I know how annoying it is when someone uses a photograph of yours without tweeting it, without uh, without citing the, uh, the the credit. Um, so, yeah, I, I always try and do that. But yeah, photography is um, and the outdoors generally. It's a good uh, a good antidote to chess because sometimes it all does get a little bit intense, and uh, and it is an indoor habit. And I think it's good to to try and uh, have a, 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 an alternative occupation or preoccupation that keeps you keeps you fit, keeps you um, Keeps you moving and and is also quite complimentary in that when the weather's good you can be uh, you can be outside when the weather's not so good you've always got chest to fall back on and vice versa. Yeah, yeah, and you've got some great pictures on. You sent me your your photography <laughs> website, so I'll link to that so people can check it out. <laughs> and yeah. Uh, and yeah, the pictures you uncover for your blog obviously are amazing. The chest pictures. Yeah, that's just a matter of using the advanced uh, search engine, and sometimes uh, you can try it in. in uh, Try it in Russian as well. You're likely to open up some different sources from. Uh, oh, from interesting. The so okay. yeah, that's a good tip there. But uh, yeah, it's it's again, it's a phenomenal amount of information out there, and, and occasionally, uh, if I'm bored, I might take five minutes and just uh, put something into the search engine and see what comes up. And occasionally, even putting the same search term that you put in a few months previously, uh, something new appears. Huh. And, but yeah, the, uh, the Dutch archives in particular are, are just uh, incredible. Um, and obviously, chess has long been popular in, in the Netherlands, and they have this online archive, which uh, uh, I reckon probably 30 or 40% of the chess photos you see online um, come from it. Um, uh, it's just fantastic. I remember when I found it by accident about five or six years ago, and I just couldn't believe the, the stuff they had on there. You know, like for example, the World Championship match tournament in 1948. There's pictures from it, and uh, the candidates in '56 uh, in Amsterdam. I mean, all all the big tournaments that have been held in the Netherlands. Almost there's there's something. Yeah. So, okay, you'll have to send me a link for that too. I can do that. Yeah, no problem at all, Ben. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Um, and l- l- I think this is my last question. You mentioned yeah. you you have two teenagers. Uh, do they yeah. do they have any interest in chess? They don't. No, none at all. I mean, I did. Um, Expose them to it early, but uh, neither of the two of them are boy and a girl, and they, neither of them seem to be particularly interested. So I didn't, didn't want to push it. So uh, no, they've got plenty, plenty of interests, but chess not among them. Okay, all right. Well, yeah. I mean, uh, gotta let them lead their own lives. So exactly. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, Doug, this has been awesome. Um, we'll link to your blog and your Twitter account. Um, I think people can email you through the blog, but I don't know if you want to share your email address for all the publishers yeah, that are going to come come yeah, pounding down your door now. <laughs> well, you never know. Uh, yes, I'll be happy to do that. Yeah. Okay. Um, excellent. So, yeah, I'll put that in the show notes, too. And, Doug, this has been awesome. I've been, been looking forward to it, and it did not disappoint. Great. Thanks, Ben. It's been an interesting experience. I've been thinking a lot uh, the last week or so about what, uh, what we might talk about and covered, covered just about all of it. So it's been, it's been good. Excellent. All right. And good luck with the book. And yeah, good luck with the other books. Maybe we can have you back on sometime once, you, you're, <laughs> once you're rolling them out. It'd be a pleasure. And uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks to, uh, just I should say as well, just thanks to uh, people who've made some kind comments about my blogs, um, both on your, on your show the, and also just online on Twitter. So Yeah, I mean, it seems like you're building quite a following. Um, uh, yeah, well, that's good. It's just say I'm just happy to put stuff out there that people are, are interested in. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, it's um, great work that you're doing. So keep it up, Doug. Thanks, Ben. Thanks to everyone who helps make Perpetual Chess possible. That includes my producer, Matthew Passy, Geert Vandervelt for supplying the theme music, my wonderful guests, of course. And I also want to thank everyone who helps spread the word about the show, whether it's on Facebook, on Twitter, or on Instagram, telling an actual friend, an actual person about it. Every little bit helps grow the show. 
But most of all, I want to thank people who support the show financially. Without your financial support, this show would not be possible. I love doing it, but it is a lot of work. So I most of all want to thank Chessable for their support. And I also would like to give extra special thanks to the following people and entities. Quality Chess Books, the Capital City Chess Club, Andrew Bach, Austin Clough, Benjamin Handelman, Kathy Carr, Chad Oliver, Dan O'Hanlon, I am Dimitri Schneider, Greg Shahadi, Guven Manet, Jens Green, John Jernigan, Kelly Palmer, Lone Pine Chess, the Law Offices of Stuart Katz, Sidney Andrews, Thomas Tachenko, and Todd Bryant. And I'd also like to thank the following Patreon partners. You guys are Aaron Wafflart, Ace Vallega, Adam Ralph of ChessEngland.com. Adam Vrancouge, Adrian Gutierrez, Alex Pejas, BetterChessTraining.com, Bill Moran, Brett Howard Lynn, Brett Zeldo, Brian Mullis, Chad Hilton, Chris Balcom, Chris Flanagan, Chris Wayne Scott, Christopher Bumgardner, Christopher Chabri, Christopher Wood, I am Christoph Zalicki, a.k.a. Chess Explained, Coach Jay's Chess Academy, Daniel Gell, Daniel Ginsberg, Daniel Lucas of the U.S. Chess Federation, Daniel Naylor, Daniel Schaefer, Dave Saylor, David Cramley of Chessable.com, Dwayne Edmonds, Ethan Smith, I am elect Donnie Ariel, the Fox Valley Chess Club of Aurora, Illinois, Frank Tortoris, MD, Gary Andrews, Gary Lewis, Geert Vandervelt of Chessable.com, Gerard Barda, Giovanni Russo, Greg Natal, Harish Srinivasan, GM Jakob Ogard of Quality Chess Publishing, James Bonastia, Jason Woolham, Jeff Anderson, Jeffrey Martello, John Fernandez, John Fontaine, John Hartman, Jen Shahadi, Jerry Wells, JJ Strand, John Thompson, GM Josh Friedel, Kare Christensen, WGM Katarina Nemsova, Kelly Palmer, I am Kostya Kovyutsky, Krishna Gopala Krishnan, Laura Boyavsky, Lucio Casada Silva, Martin Knudsen, Matthew Passi, Matthew Tedesco of SeattleChessMeetup.org, The Mysterious Moon Master 9000, The Legend Grows, Mr. Mike Shahadi, Nate Salon, Neil Bruce, GM Pascal Charbonneau, Passi Passanen, Paul Bain, Paul Clarkson, Paul Sweeney, Paulo Santana, Peter Lux, Peter Merrifield, Randy Temple, Ricky Grijalva, Robert Steiner, Ryan Berg, Scott Doherty, Scott McKinnon, Steiner Lima, WGM Tatia Abrahamian, Thomas Stanix, Thomas Tachenko, Tim Brennan of TacticsTime.com, Tim Seymour, Timothy Ha, Tony Rotella, Tyron Price, Victor Vrancouge, William Peterson, Zhao Chang of Chess1000.com, and Zhivko Stoyanov. Thanks, everyone. Catch you guys next week. Yeah.